Hello, I'm Susan Woods, your Black Lives Matter fraud investigator. Thank you for your time. In this video, I'm going to analyze part six of the Form 990 information return that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted for fiscal year 2020. Again, I'm focusing on part six, which is governance, management, and disclosure. What is the Form 990? I'm just gonna let this sit here on the screen because I've read it several times. So I'm just gonna give you an opportunity to read the definition of the Form 990, paying special attention to when it's due and what happens if you fail to file for three consecutive years. So just take a few moments to read that information for yourself. Okay, thank you. Now, in this video message, we're going to examine Form 990 and the instructions for Part 6, Governance, Management, and Disclosure. I want to take a look at this map before we jump into the Form 990. I want to take a look at this map to show you that in 2020, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation had several chapters across the United States, as you can see here. And I investigated many of those chapters and you can find the results of my investigation in the video messages that are on this YouTube channel. You can identify them by Black Lives Matter New York, Black Lives Matter Philadelphia, so on and so forth. But I just wanted to show you this map because it's going to become a very important part of the information that I'm getting ready to share with you about part six of the Form 990. So just, again, just know that there was a map with chapters identified, chapter locations identified on the map. Okay, now I'm going to pause my screen so that I can get to where I need to be to share with you the information about the Form 990. So just one moment, please, as I transition over to the Form 990, as you are accustomed to me doing by now. Thank you for your patience. Now we're looking at the Form 990 information return that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted for fiscal year 2020. And we are on page six. And we're looking at part six, which is governance, management, and disclosure. So I'm going to go down a little bit and let's take a look at section A. Now this, this particular part is divided into three sections, sections A, B and C. So let's take a look at section A first, governing body and management. I've identified the red flags by highlighting them. So the first red flag that I identified is 1A, where it says, enter the number of voting members of the governing body at the end of the tax year. The red flag for me here is the number one. One member of the governing body, and the governing body is the board of directors. They only had one person, and that was Patrice Kahn Coolers in 2020. So you had one person governing the financial management of $90 million. That's a red flag. The second red flag for me is number two. Did any officer, director, trustee, or key employee have a family relationship or a business relationship with any other officer, director, trustee, or key employee? And the answer they supplied was no. As you can see, this X here under the no column. That's a red flag because Patrice Kahn Coolers, who was the only employee and board member in 2020, had a relationship obviously with her biological brother. She hired her biological brother as an employee, as a contractor rather, to serve as security, as security personnel. 
and he did not have any experience as a security guard or any form of security, and he was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for that role. Another relationship that she had during that time frame was with the father of her son. She hired the father of her son to serve as a videographer and paid him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then finally, she had a relationship, of course, with her spouse, her wife, who operated the Toronto, Canada Black Lives Matter division. So for them to say there was no relationship among key employees and members of the board is false. That's not true. That's a red flag. The answer should have been yes instead of no. Going down to number four, did the organization make any significant changes to its governing documents since the prior Form 990 was filed? Well, the problem with that is when you say prior Form 990, you're referencing Form 990 for fiscal year 2019. Fiscal year 2019, according to IRS filings, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted a Form 990N e-postcard, which meant that they were claiming they generated $50,000 or less in 2019. So there were significant changes in the governing documents, or it should have been, when you go from $50,000 or less to $90 million. The answer there was no, but it should be yes. It has to be significant changes in the governing body or governing documents when you go from one extreme to the next. So that's the red flag. The red flag is because they answered no to that question when the answer should have been yes. Line number five, did the organization become aware during the year of significant diversion of the organization's assets? When you say organization, you're talking about the people who operate the organization. And again, in 2020, it was Patrice Kahn Coolers. So definitely she was aware of herself diverting funds from the organization to purchase three mansions that I'm sure she was aware of that. And also diverting funds to buy a $6 million office space in Toronto, Canada for her wife to operate the Black Lives Matter global the Black Lives Matter chapter out of that office space for $6 million in Canada. So then the diversion of money to her brother and to the father of her son, and then the relationship that she had with Shalamaya Bowers, a consultant in which she paid over $2 million. So she was well aware of the way she herself was diverting funds or diverting assets. Funds are assets. So the red flag is the answer no when the answer should have been yes for number for line five. Let's go down to line eight. Did the organization contemporaneously document the meetings held or written actions undertaken during the year by the following people? The governing body, each committee with authority to act on behalf of the governing body. So what is this question asking? Did anyone track meeting minutes from the governing body? So whenever the board of directors had a meeting, did anyone track that information to make it publicly available for anyone to read as is required by bylaws? Or did any member of the committee do, um, as I just mentioned, did they provide any type of documentation of information they shared during meetings that they held? when acting on behalf of the governing body or the board of directors, surprisingly, they told the truth. They said no. But the red flag for me is that's wrong. You're supposed to make meeting minutes available to the public on your website for inspection. Anyone that needs to know what's going on behind closed doors in a board meeting should have the opportunity to read that information, unless it's something regarding maybe compensation. But other than that, the bylaws should stipulate that the meeting minutes are open to the public. And they admit here they did not do it. And that's a red flag. And what bothers me about this is 
they are blatantly saying, no, we didn't do it. We didn't follow the rules. And submitted this form 990 to the Internal Revenue Service for review and inspection. So how can they not be called out by the IRS for this answer? I'm just confused. Let's go to line nine under section A. Is there any officer, director, trustee, or key employee listed in part seven, section A, who cannot be reached at the organization's mailing address? Now, we haven't gotten to part seven yet, but when you're talking about officer, director, trustee, those are names that are used interchangeably when referring to the board of directors. And we already know the board of directors had one member. So to answer that question is, is there any officer, director, trustee, or key employee listed who cannot be reached at the organization's mailing address? They answered no, but the answer should be yes. You cannot reach or you could not reach Patrice Conkoulis when reporters went to the mailing address on file for the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation to try to get some answers to the questions that public the public has been posing about this organization. The security guard said that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation did not reside or have an office in that particular building at that mailing address. So the answer should be yes. You cannot reach anybody from the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation at the mailing address they provided. So that's section A. I've identified the red flags in section A as 1A, 2, 4, 5, 8, and 9. So I've identified six red flags from just this one section A of part 6. So let's go down now to section B from part 6. Part 6, section B. Now section B deals with the policies. The policies. So 10A, did the organization have local chapters, branches, or affiliates? And they answered no. Now, do you remember before I went to this Form 990, I showed you a yellow map with black dots to identify the locations of the Black Lives Matter chapters in 2020? So I don't know why they would list the answer as no here when clearly on their original website, which of course has been updated and you don't see this information anymore, there was a map and I got the map from the website. So I wanted you to see that. That's why I said, remember, you're seeing a map of Black Lives Matter chapters because I knew this question was gonna come up and they should have answered yes, but they answered no. And that's a red flag. Going down to 12A, did the organization have a written conflict of interest policy? Were officers, directors, or trustees, and key employees required to disclose annual, annually interests that could give rise to conflicts? And did the organization regularly and consistently monitor and enforce compliance with the policy? Um, they answered yes to all of those questions. And the conflict of interest policy is intended to make sure that the organization does not have people serving who benefit unfairly from being a part of the organization. So although they answered yes, I can't say whether or not they actually have a policy in place because they very well could have a policy in place, but I can say they did not adhere to the policy. If the conflict of interest policy is written according to IRS guidelines, they clearly did not adhere to it when you have Patrice Con Cooler spending money buying mansions. So that's benefiting her unfairly, and that's a violation of the conflict of interest policy. So that's a red flag for 12A. Going down to 15, did the process for determining compensation of the following persons include a review and approval by independent persons, comparability data, and contemporaneous substantiation of the deliberation and decision. Well, and it says they're asking about the organization CEO, executive director, or top management official, and then B, other officers or key employees of the organization. 
They're very bold. They said they said no, we didn't we didn't have anybody independently determine whether or not, you know, we could give this money away. We didn't have anybody on the outside looking at how money flowed as far as compensation. So they were bold to say they did not do that. And that goes back again to where is the IRS person that reviewed this Form 990? How can you be okay with them admitting? No, we didn't, we didn't look at any any comparability data. We didn't do anything. We just used the money how we wanted to. We just compensated ourselves the way we wanted to compensate ourselves. You know, I just get, I mean, Patrice Concudos just gave money to her brother, to the father of her son, to her wife, to Shalamaya Bowers, and anybody else that she chose to give money to, to the LGBTQIA organizations. They didn't, I mean, so what? I just don't know how the IRS is okay with this. I'm I'm confused. And then finally, let's go down to section C, which is disclosure. And with section C, um, the red flag for me there is line 17. And it says, list the states with which a copy of this form 990 is required to be filed. And so the reason a nonprofit organization would have to file a form 990 in a state is because when you operate in different states, you should have gotten approval from the Secretary of State's office to let them know you are operating a division or chapter of your organization in that state so that they will have the opportunity to track or be aware of the revenues that you generate. So the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation is saying that we have to file the Form 990 in all of these states listed because we are doing business in those states. Now, let's go back to when they said they didn't have any chapters. If you don't have any chapters, then what entities are operating in the states that you listed? They have to be chapters. So they listed the, the, uh, the number of states that would fit on the line here but as you can see at the bottom, we have highlighted in yellow, it says C Schedule O for full list of states. And we're going to go to Schedule O in just a moment. So you can see the full list of states in which they have to provide a Form 990. Let me share something to, with you that's very um, enlightening for me here. Now, you, you see the list of states. You don't see Delaware listed. Way back in the beginning of our analysis of this Form 990, you may remember that I pointed out that they indicated they filed their articles of incorporation in the state of Delaware. And I was wondering why they would file in Delaware when they have their address in California. But then I reminded you that most people or most organizations that do not operate in the most transparent way, for some reason, file their articles in the state of Delaware. I still haven't figured out why yet. But Another thing I want to point out before, and that was a red flag, by the way, that Delaware is enlisted when they stated they filed their articles in Delaware. 18, line 18, which is not a red flag, it's just an FYI, to let you know that section 6104 requires an organization to make this form 1023, 990, and 990T, which is trust, available for public inspection. So if you need or you want to see the information here for yourself or for any other organization, you can request it. You can request it because whenever an organization files for 501c3 status, they complete the Form 1023 and the Form 23 lets them know that their application is open for public inspection. So when you look at the Form 1023, which is the original application for the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, you can see what they plan to offer, what services they were requesting the IRS to approve for them to offer in order to earn tax-free money. So I just want to point that out. Now I'm going to go to Schedule O so that we can take a look at the other states in which the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation must file a Form 990. So the Schedule O is on page 54, so I'm going to go there now. So here we are. You can see Schedule O over here in the corner. Um, 
And the Schedule O just provides supplemental information to the Form 990 or 990EZ. As you can see, it's open for public inspection. Look at the year. Always look at the year. Make sure you're looking at the right year of filing when you're investigating a nonprofit organization. So we are on 2020 for the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. The name of the organization, of course, is what we're investigating. And then the, the fiscal year 2020 is what we're looking at. Okay. So now I want to go back to section C, line 17, which talked about the number of states in which the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation must file the Form 990. So let's go down. I'm just going to scroll down because I've already highlighted it. And here we are, Form 990, Part 6, Section A, Line 8A. Let me go back to 8A right quick. Um, 8A just talks about where are you um, governing. And as you can see, per what law? Delaware law. The board consisted of one voting director. As such, no board meetings were held during the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Now look at this. This is loaded with information. This is loaded. Number one, why would the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation reference Delaware when they didn't reference it as a state in which it should receive the Form 990s? So, in this case, they're saying that per Delaware law, the board only consisted of one voting director, which was true, Patrice Kahn Coolers. So as such, no board meetings were held during that fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Now, they're saying that because it was one voting director, and we've already addressed that silliness, they didn't have any meetings. So this goes back to why they didn't have any meetings. Well, they didn't have any because one only one person. That's stupid, right? But another thing I want to point out to you here is the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. This was fiscal year 2020, which should have been January 1st or December 31st, 2020. But when they just determined, oh my goodness, you know, we, we don't need to report all of this money that we got in one year. Let's change our reporting schedule and let's end it with June the 30th, 2021, thereby cutting out several months. And so we'll get into that later. But this is a trick. This is a trick that they use to reduce the revenues they had to report. Okay. Instead of going January through December 2020, it's changed up and it started recording in July of 2020. So it could end in June of 2021. Just another trick, another trick that they used to reduce the amount they had to claim on their Form 990. But let me go ahead and continue down so we can get to um, Part 6, Line 17. I'm sorry, Part 6, Section C, Line 17. So that's what we're looking for. And here we are. Part Form 990, Part 6, Line 17, list of states receiving copy of Form 990. And you can see all of these states. But which one do you not see? Which one is not listed that we just talked about? Delaware. Right? We talked about Delaware. Delaware dictating the fact that because they only had one board member, they didn't have to have any meetings. Therefore, you don't get to see any minutes because there were no meetings to document meeting minutes. Why isn't it listed here? Isn't that strange that you wouldn't list the state in which the state that dictates your behavior, the state in which you filed your articles of incorporation? But once again, why isn't the IRS doing a better job in managing this? I'm going to pause my screen so we can go back and finish up with um, the lesson. So I'm going to pause my screen just for a moment and get back to where we stopped off. So we can look at the, so we can calculate the red flags. So we can calculate the red flags. So just a second here. Okay, we're almost there. Almost there. Calculate these red flags. Okay, we're here now. So 
To wrap it up, we talked about part six of the Form 990 information return that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted for fiscal year 2020. And it's governance, management, and disclosure, talking about section A, the governing body and management. Line 1A, the governing body, one member had, I should have put had, one member manager $90 million. That's a red flag to me. Line two, Patrice Conn Coolers hired her brother, boyfriend, and friend when they said they didn't hire anybody with a close relationship with a member of the board. So that's a red flag. Number four, they filed the Form 990 in for fiscal year 2019. Why would you do that? How can you go from, I guess it's possible, but it just shows a red flag in that you're saying you've been around, but you're saying in 2019, you generated $50,000 or less. And then, then in 2020, you do over 90 million. That's a red flag. Line five, Patrice Con Curlers that Con Coolers diverted millions, which represent major assets. When you talk about millions of dollars, money is an asset. So she diverted millions to different things. Line eight, the organization admits it did not document meeting minutes because they only had one board member. So the board member can't meet by himself, by herself. So they didn't bother by doing meeting minutes. Nobody knows what's going on because there's no accountability. In line nine, the mailing, the mailing address is not accurate. The mailing address to the headquarters or their office is not accurate. And because someone went there, reporters went there to the address they provided and the security guard said that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation did not work out of that building. So those are the errors or red flags that I doc documented in part six, section A, for a total of six red flags. Let's keep going. Part two, governance management, and part six, I'm sorry, governance, management, and disclosure. Section B, the policies. Online 10A, the, gov the organization had several chapters when it said it didn't have any chapters. That's not true. I showed you the map. There's several chapters across the United States. Line 12A, the organization admits to not following the conflict of interest policy. No, we're not following a conflict of interest policy. We're going to provide our own compensation without comparing it to other nonprofits' compensation levels. We're not going to have an independent person come in and analyze whether or not our compensation meets the requirements for our roles. We're just going to do what we want. They admitted that. And then line 15, the organization admits it did not get compensation approval. Again, going back to the conflict of interest policy, they're not following it. They're allowing themselves to benefit from being a part of the organization in ways that are not fair. And that's what the conflict of interest policy is all about. And again, they did not, they admit they did not get approval for anything. They just did it. So for that reason, I identified three red flags from section B of part six. Section C, Part 6, Disclosure, Line 17. The state of Delaware is not listed. That's a red flag for me, and I've already explained why. That's the state in which they registered with the Secretary of State's office, the state that governs how they operate their board of directors and meetings and accountability, but yet they're not listed as one of the states that requires a Form 990. And in Schedule O, when we read the full list of states, where the organization filed a Form 990 as required, Delaware is not listed there either. So for that, I have two red flags for Section C, Disclosure. So now let's take a look at the cumulative red flags so far. Going down to Part 6, Governance, Management, and Disclosure, Section A, six red flags. Section B, three red flags. Section C, two red flags. When you add up the red flags from part six to the other parts and the heading, we have so far 35 red flags, 35 red flags. And we are still on page six. We're only on page six of the Form 990 information return. 35 red flags. I'm going to compile all of this information into an Excel word, an Excel spreadsheet and I'm going to include links to the information in the spreadsheet. And I'm going to send it to the IRS to see what's going on. 
What's, how can an organization get away with 35 red flags? And I am not a forensic investigator. I'm not a forensic accountant. I don't have the skills that the IRS accountants have. So how can I, being a novice, identify 35 red flags just based on the knowledge I've acquired over my 20 years of working in the nonprofit sector? But I'm nowhere near an expert in Form 990s. So if I can see this, clearly they can. I'm Susan Woods, your Black Lives Matter fraud investigator. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.